Do you think you have a badass kayak? Do you think it's going to turn some heads? Saturday, March 25th, Jake Spate and Tackle is hosting a kayak show and seminar. The kayak show starts at 1030. They'll be giving away $500 worth of prizes. The categories are the youth division, 18 and under, the DIY division, if you put $1,000 or less into the kayak, the best river kayak setup, the best big water kayak setup, and then the best in show. If you're interested, you can bring your kayak out. It costs $5 and all the money goes to the Frederick County Bass Club. If you're interested, email information at jakespaintandtackle.com to register. Again, email information at jakespaintandtackle.com to register. On top of that, we're going to have seminars throughout the day. At 1130, we'll have Mike Ortega talking about kayak tournament fishing. 101. At 1230, we'll have Sela Johnson talking about intro to kayak fishing. At 1.30, we'll have Josh Evans talking about rhyme and reason and how to rig the perfect kayak. And of course, Fishing the DMV will be there to live stream it. Again, that's Saturday, March 25th at Jake's Bait and Tackle. Doors open at 10.30 for the kayak show. Stay for all the seminars, the food, and watch the Bassmaster Classic. We'll see you there. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and we got a really special guest on. We got Will Brewer. Um, He just got back a couple weeks ago from a really cool event at Lake Murray, and I'm trying to sprinkle in more and more of the kayak guys. guys. It's really, I'm I'm trying to do a better job of diversifying everything from the Potomac to the Upper James to the boat to the kayak, and so now that tournaments are starting to get going again, we can kind of get revamped, Um, and I really wanted to talk about this in particular because we took a guy that a a Potomac, Virginia stick, and now he went to Lake Marie, (laughs) the uh, blue back deep and clear. And I think that's always fascinating when, and actually, William, would you consider yourself like a a, a river rat or like a a river guy primarily, like as your upbringing? No, I actually, no, I'm not very good on the river, to be honest with you. Really? So, yeah, it hasn't been one of my strong suits. It's definitely one of my uh, weak points that I want to get better at this year. So I'm definitely going to focus a little bit more on those tidal waters and rivers and stuff like that. So, so yeah. Set this... Oh, continue. No, I was just going to say, like, uh, most of the time I fish a lot of, you know, bigger lakes and things like that. Probably a little bit more clear to stain lakes. Uh, I definitely had a lot more experience with that last year. Uh, fishing through the KFL and stuff like that. Going up to New York and St. Clair and things like that. So, uh, I'm definitely getting better at those, but oh, I think one of my biggest weaknesses is definitely the, like titles and rivers. So that's what I'm going to focus on this year. So b- before we get into that, I mean, I guess set the stage on, on what happened here at Lake Murray. Yeah, man. So, uh, we went down to uh KBF Lake Mur- Murray. What was that? Uh, March 25th or something like that. I can't remember the, the dates on them. Uh, but we went down there. I had about three days of practice. Uh, practice wasn't very good for me. Uh, I actually didn't find out anything until the last day, probably like the last hour of uh, legitimate um, official practice time, right? So we had to be off the water by four o'clock. So it wasn't until like the last hour or so before I actually figured out anything. And the three days that I did have practice, it was nice, bright, and sunny, you know? So, and then the two tournament days were overcast, rain, and uh, the temperature dropped, temperature dropped a little bit. But uh, mm. fortunately for me, the water temps didn't. So, um, yeah, I figured out a little pattern on the last day. Throw on a shaky head. Uh, on the last day, the last hour, I found them a little bit closer to the ends of the docks on deeper water, about that eight-foot mark or so. And... Um, I kind of utilized that. I knew there wasn't enough fish in that last spot that I fished on the last practice day to take me into the tournament week. So I moved back to my day one spot uh, after utilizing the new One Boat Network uh, app from Hummingbird. So I I utilized that, went through, uh, did a a depth highlight of eight foot and then went through and looked where all the docks were. And that was the most, the area with the most deeper docks uh, next to shallow water. Uh, so I went there and, um, and utilized the same technique, man. I just went through a, uh, a Berkeley bottom hopper on a shaky head. Uh, I'm not sure if you saw this is this podcast or not, but, uh, it just kind of looked like that right there, you know, okay. owner shaky head. Yeah. The owner shaky head with a Berkeley bottom hopper. I utilized the, the green pumpkin red flake. 
And when I ran, when I went through two packs of those, catching so many fish, uh, I finally switched over to green pumpkin, purple flake, and it didn't seem to really affect anything. So I think it might have been just that little bit of green pumpkin color. Um, the cool thing about for me is there were so many people on day one through the area that I was fishing. I had maybe I had the spot for maybe about an hour or two wow. before everyone started showing up. Uh, I caught the biggest fish on day one, which was like a 21 and a quarter. And I caught that off of a slobber knocker with a hmm. Berkeley chicken crawl as a trailer, right? So black and blue. Uh, lucked out, had a dock with a little one of those little green fish attractor bait lights on it. So I was like, yep, that's where I'm going to start at first thing in the morning, pitch black, dark, threw out there maybe four or five casts. And on that fifth cast, uh, stuck right into that. A nice, nice hog, man. That is a Got great it, thing, though. I just want to make sure the audience, if you ever want to go down to those blueback lakes, and I learned this when I fished the college championships down in those, those herring lakes, go there if if it allows at night and look for those lights, any kind of lights like that at those docks, because those are very key docks. I'm sorry. Keep going. No, absolutely. You know, it's set up really great. It not only had that green light on there that was shining all through the night with the rain and the dark and stuff like that. It was a it's a floating dock. And on top of that, it was at deeper water. It went from shallow to about that eight foot of water. And um, it went from that shallow to eight foot of water, man. And uh, that seemed to be where they were setting up at. I think this this particular dock also had like a little channel swing that went into okay. it also. So it worked out really well. So hit a couple more docks around there. And I kept working my way around this little cove and... Uh, by that time, some other people, some other boats, I think they had a high school bass fishing tournament that was going on there and they started pulling up in front of me. But the cool thing is they were only hit the front of the docks. By this time, they started pushing a little bit deeper into the docks and I was probably skipping that shaky head in between the floating docks. And it only may have been like, you know, six to 10 inches of clearance. So I might have mm. banged off the dock a couple of times, but once I got it under there, I just kind of let it soak for a little bit. And eventually uh, you'd start to see your line move. Like the bite wasn't even like a, a good little thump. You just had to really watch your line. And as it started swimming away, you reel down, set into it. And uh, I kept on getting bigger and bigger and bigger fish. I was like, man, I have, a, I have an opportunity to, to place pretty well here. So obviously that builds that confidence into, into everything else you're doing. And um, you know, it allowed me to skip over a couple extra docks because I knew they weren't the right setup for it. You know, when, when did you so have you confidence in yourself time. that day? When did I have confidence? Like, like, oh shit, this is a thing. Like we all have that. I think at that moment in a big tournament that we do well. And like, it starts playing in your head. Like I might have something here. Yeah. You know, once I kind of, uh, probably about that third fish or so. Uh, and I think for that particular third fish, there's this nice little floating dock that was setting up and they throw a lot of Christmas trees out there too. I know Murray's known for its cane piles and stuff like that that people throw out, but they also take the Christmas trees and they throw them under their docks. So I had the opportunity. I saw this one come up. I fished the first side of it and then I went all the way around the dock on the back side of it and then cast it in there. And I think it was a 17 or 18 or something like that. And I was just like, man, this is, I'm catching quality fish, not just numbers of fish, but legitimate quality of fish. And that's probably when it clicked on me. Like, I'm just going to sit here with a shaky head in my hand all day long and, uh, and skip underneath these docks. Cause I was going behind people and catching fish. Like you can see them looking back at me as I'm netting fish and Interesting. other kayakers went through and stuff like that. So you really had to let it soak and be patient with it. Is it because you went with a finesse approach first when Lake Murray docks is usually you're thinking a jig or something like that. It, was that the difference maker you think? Oh, uh, I mean, it's a possibility. I think uh, if you start using more of those moving baits and stuff like that, and, um, you know, for me, it might have worked a different way for somebody else. When you start throwing a chatterbait past and running it down the side of docks, or if you couldn't get a, a jig underneath the dock itself, um, you start running back, you start pulling those fish out from underneath there, and then you try to skip back under there. If they didn't hit it or anything like that, and then there's nothing there because you've already pulled them out. Now they got to find a way back under there. Um, so I think probably because I went with a more finesse approach, right in the beginning versus cranking and constantly with the, uh, the slobber knocker in my hand. Uh, it probably helped me out a lot. One thing that I've always been fascinated with kayak guys, again, I had a boating background for the longest time. 
is when you practice to be able to break down water because you can't just just hammer down your 250. And Lake Murray is, guys, for you don't know that live in Virginia, it's a big ass lake. It really is. And you said you had about three days of practice. How do you take? Do you do you network where you have a group of guys that you go out with that share a house with? Or how do you break down such a big body of water for just three days? Uh, yeah, I mean, for, for three days itself, um, I mean, obviously during tournament time, now the new rules, you're not allowed to talk once the tournament starts and stuff like that. But we do travel down with a couple of guys, uh, stay in a hotel. Um, some of us, we might say, Hey, where are you going? All right. Well, if you're going there, there's no point in me going there. Mm -hmm. you, that way, if you figure out something, you have a spot to yourself. I'm not trying to come take your spot. I might find something in a different part of the lake or someone maybe goes way up the lake and, and figures out they're hitting there, or maybe it's just too muddy or it's blown out. And it's not going to work, you know? So, and then we come back, have our dinners and drink it over a couple of beers and things like that. It, you know, that's what kayaking is. It's, it's a, it's a good community of anglers that want to sit there and share information and talk about fishing. So it, there's definitely that, that helps. Um, so, I mean, we, we all kind of figured out a pattern and we kind of bounce it off of each other. Like, Oh, that's how I caught them too. That's how I caught them too. So then you can kind of narrow down some other things, you know? Um, if everyone's catching them off of docks and shaky heads or finesse worms or something like that, then, you know, chances are that's probably how you're going to catch them across the lake anyway. Yeah. And, that, and that's what's so important because, I mean, you can have these conversations to we're, to we're blue in the face about about what information to take in and out or the dock talk. And it's hard because you can go down a rabbit hole. You know, when I traveled, I shared a house with a bunch of other dudes and it was so weird in some tournaments where I just didn't want to hear anyone else talk because it got in my head. But on other times, like that was to my detriment because it, and it's not just about the baits guys, it's about making sure you're at the right place of the lake that just, that's going off. And that's so hard when you get older because you could play such head games with yourself, with your buddies and with, with making sure you don't put too much in and it affects your style of fishing. Yeah, absolutely, man. You you have to stick. I mean, ultimately, everyone has their own strengths and weaknesses of what techniques they fish the best. And even though other people are catching them here, you got to kind of stick with your own gut feeling and the techniques that you're strongest with. And for me, I've definitely gotten better with a uh, with a shaky head over the last you know year or so. Um, just built a lot of confidence in it, and I knew that if I was getting bit on them, then I could make them bite on it. Um, I mean, I definitely lost a couple of good fish that I probably could have ended up in second place. I don't think I could have caught Casey Reed at 97 or 98 inches that he had. Uh, but that's just one time, different you know, one, you know, like there's like, what are you going to do? Like some people, it's just, it's just their day. I, I had this, I have this one kid on um, Hunter Smith and he talked about how his Garmin and his trolling motor broke at, at the BFL at Piedmont. And so he stopped his spot, went to the, went back towards the boat ramp threw a mag draft, boom, caught his kicker. Like that doesn't happen unless it's meant to be like something like that. And yeah. so I, I don't know. It's just when it gets to like one of those two fish, like, what are you going to do? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if, you, if you're catching them constantly, you know, I, I'm a strong, I mean, yeah, you can upsize baits or things like that, try to maybe catch a slightly bigger fish or something like that. For the most part, though, you really can't control uh, what's going to bite. You know, they're either there or they're not. So if they're, if they're biting all on a shaky head, I can catch big ones on a shaky head. I can catch a little one on a shaky head. I can upsize it, like you said, and throw a big mag draft or something like that. And, uh, and maybe I catch a slightly bigger fish. But at the same time, I'd rather go through a bunch of fish and then hopefully upgrade those coals because one, it keeps my confidence up. And two, I know that they're still biting on that. Um, and eventually you're going to pick through all the little ones, you know? Um, you mentioned earlier, like, uh, was it a conscious decision to fish the shaky head more? Like, hey, I just want to practice and get better with this bait. Like, what made that all come to fruition this past year? Oh, man. You know, uh, last year I fished a lot of the KFL. I didn't do too many national tournaments. Um you know, I had a lot going on and I stuck with KFL because it was a little bit easier for me in my schedule for work and stuff like that. And it's just something that I built a lot of confidence in, man. I, you know, I started going to all these new, new lakes and I had to literally break down a lake in one day and and fish it. If I, if I even got a chance to pre-fish it, sometimes you just show up there the night before, then you're going to fish your game the next month, the next day, and you got to try to figure out something then and there. So I think that's definitely been a, a big benefit for me as trying to break down water quickly and, you know, always going with some type of finesse or something like that. You can, you can definitely find them. They're, you're more likely to get those bites and then you get the bites and you build your confidence with it. And then you figure out exactly what they're on, whether they're on. It's, it's something I utilized even going down to Kissimmee. Um, hmm. 
been down in January. Um, everyone uses black and blue. I threw that same green pumpkin red flake, but on a Texas rig up against Cypress and stuff like that. And I was catching fish left and right. Um, so, you know, it's just something you build confidence with. Once you start using it, you start catching a lot of fish on it. It's the same concept if you go out with a, with a crankbait during, you know, pre-spawn or something like that. And you start going off the end of these points and start slaying fish. You know, you start building a little bit of confidence in that crankbait. It's interesting because, I mean, in the past couple of years, I've really seen that I've substituted a jig with a shaky head, especially on the Potomac and the Upper Bay, tidal bodies of water that are classic power fishing. But I see myself using that shaky head on a bait casting setup on docks and stuff. And it's, it's really made me to think is like, is the jig kind of losing some of its luster in the past years? Is the shaky head taking over for it in a lot of situations? I don't know. It just feels yeah. like it. Yeah, I mean, I can see where you're coming from. I think it has a, a special time and place for it. You know, summertime starts rolling around. You might want to get a little bit deeper with those jigs because, I mean, you can you can get pretty heavy on shaky heads, but at the same time, uh, having that um, that bulkier bait to get down there a little bit faster and stuff like that for those summertime fish compared to these pre-spawn spawning uh, periods. I think we kind of hit it at a mixed bag with the pre-spawn spawn at Lake Murray. Um you know, a shaky head, the way I look at it, it's almost a better version of a Texas rig, right? So a Texas rig, you can punch through things, which is what you can utilize it for a lot. Um, it more has that more vertical, straight down drop where once a shaky head gets to the bottom, it'll stand up, you know? So it kind of stands out on the bottom a little bit more where if it's a Texas rig, it's going to want to lay flat unless you have some type of floating worm or something like that where it's going to rise. If, and, you know, other factors go into it too, whether it's pegged or not pegged different things like that but i think the shaky head man it's just a, it's to me it's a better version of the texas rig hmm. in my opinion that's an interesting way of looking at it. i never thought of that way before i mean it makes perfect sense though the way you described it and plus you have the weight connected to the head so there i think that increases sensitivity believe it or not yeah if you find the right setup for you as far as shaky heads and stuff like that some people like screw lock some people don't like the screw lock because uh, it does leave a smaller gap uh, that you're trying to to get the fish's lips through and stuff like that. So you do you can miss a couple of fish. So you've got to have the right setup as far as rods and, and reels, um, especially as a kayak angler. To me, that's very important. It took me a lot of rods to kind of go through my perfect setup that I use for a shaky head to where I have enough power, but yet enough sensitivity in the rod itself to where I can get fish into the boat. Because so I was having a, a hard time uh, probably about a year, year and a half ago, where my tip was too sensitive or too soft on my shaky head from a kayak to where it wasn't getting a good deep hook penetration on them. And then I switched over to a, a heavier setup hmm. and I was just been slamming them with the, uh, with the shaky head. That so sometimes so you have to That's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> you know? You don't think about it. A lot of people don't. Whenever you're fishing off of a kayak, you lose a lot of power. Whenever you go to hook set it, your kayak moves. Um, you know, you're not on this extremely solid platform like a lot of boaters are. And your hook set angle is a little bit different too. You're, you know, you're sitting low in a kayak. If you don't stand up, it's it's coming more at an angle versus if you're sitting on a boat. Sometimes it can be straight up. You know, it's a little bit higher. You can reel down a little bit easier and set the hooks on. So. Oh my God. I mean, yeah. So like last year I got to fish my first couple of kayak tournaments and that was like, I've never fished a crankbait out of a kayak before. And I got my ass kicked. I just lost so many fish because I'm so used to being in the, how you could play them on a boat. And I, I should have won the, um, the NVKBA smallmouth tournament, um, on the Shenandoah river, but I just had so many throw it. And that was the thing. I, I think it's exactly what you're saying. It's just, my setup was for like a boat and I can't play them the same way in a kayak. Yeah, no, absolutely, man. Uh, you know, if you actually sit back in a kayak and you sit still and you throw us like a big plug or something like that, say like a Berkeley dredger or something like one of the little 25 foot divers, you'll start to see your boat, your kayak is actually being pulled as you're cranking. So you're moving forward, the crankbait's coming to you, and then you still, you know, once you feel the the pressure on, you know, as it loads up, you don't realize, like, even though you're hook setting it or, you know, at least sweeping it, your kayak's still moving forward. So sometimes, you know. Wish you I gotta, knew that. <laughs> you got to keep those things in mind, you know. 
So, but it's such little detail. It is. I mean, it's such a little detail thing, but it makes such a big difference. Yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, you know, and I don't ever figure out these things on my own. So, I mean, some things I figure out on my own, but I think being part of an amazing club like NBKBA that I've been a part of for the last three, four years, something like that, uh, the information out there and talking to some of the veteran kayak anglers, you know, the information that they want to share and their setups and what works best for them, that's that's a good priority to have when looking for clubs and things, because you can definitely learn a lot and it'll save you a lot of money on setups. You know, like I have like above me, all my rods and stuff like that. I probably have 25 rods sitting up there that I don't use anymore because I've figured out what works best for me. And you have a sweet man cave setup. I mean, I saw a little bit of it guys before we started recording here. I mean, this thing's looking nice and now he's going to have a, a, a trophy wall here shortly. <laughs> um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully so, man. Oh, dry third. Um, kayak setup. Uh, I know we mentioned it last time, but it's been a year. So I want to make sure all the fans at home understand what you're doing. So just walk us through your kayak setup. Yeah. So I fish out of, uh, you know, I've had a couple of upgrades on it, but I do fish out of a old town autopilot 136. And I keep a Solix 10 uh, as my graph on there, which I love the touch screen. You know, a lot of people love the helix and stuff like that, but I don't like pressing a bunch of buttons whenever I want to mark something. And I recently added um, Mega Live with Target Lock, which I'm pretty sure I'm the only kayak that has Target Lock. Uh, so I so cool. got that set up on there. Yeah, and definitely having that solo to the touch screen, it makes a huge difference with that Target Lock. Um, so I, I set it up that way. And it's been a phenomenal rig for me, you know, going through with the solar, with the touch screen on it and being able to, uh, to use the side, side scan and cross over brush pile or something like that. Be able to mark it, hit target lock. I can bypass it. My target lock is going to stay on it. And then I just have my my casting ring set up. I get within the distance that I want to cast, cast over it, drag it through the brush pile. And it makes a huge difference for sure being able uh, to have that set up and then i can spot lock with the uh the trolling motor that's designed uh, the, the kayaks designed around that Minn Kota trolling motor so having that it makes it phenomenal for fishing especially during the summer and uh setting up on those offshore spots man how many batteries are you running i guess you got the trolling motor and then the solex and then also the the, the turret mount that hummingbird has so is that three things that that are going to be needing the most juice uh yeah so i run two batteries right i run a 160 amp hour amped outdoors uh battery for my trolling motor that's by itself that's all it runs is just the trolling motor for the kayak it's super light um i don't ask me how many pounds yeah, it is yeah, yeah. I mean, it's probably i should probably know that but i mean it's, it's super light for 160 amp hours you can't go get an agm or even a deep cell you know lead acid it's gonna weigh a ton so for having that as super light, I've never actually had it run out. So I couldn't even tell you how far it went because I just go. I don't even worry about it. Um, and then uh, other than that, I run a 48 amp hour uh, amped outdoor um, battery that runs the Solix. It runs the Target Lock, the Mega Live with Target Lock, uh, runs cameras, lights, Damn. all those different types of things. And I've never ran out of juice on it. And I fish a lot of tournaments. So, you know, sometimes you have... You, you could have a 12 hour practice day and I've never ran out of juice and stuff like that. So dude, good stuff, man. That, that is a, that is a sweet setup. And, and that's always something I think is so interesting. The more that we have, um, the ability to really target offshore fish about how we donate our time. I mean, I really do think it's very, I, it's almost relaxing to watch a John Cox fish because it's like, well, if I don't have a sonar on my boat, I don't have to worry about anything that's like three feet or deeper. But then when you get all this stuff and I'm not guys, I don't want to get in the bait today about like whether you want four fishing center or not. I just meant the fact that it opens up this new area. Now you have to mentally deal with, okay, now I can fish the whole lake. How do I break this down so quickly? Do you have any like personal rules of thumbs to, to what you approach? Is it time of year? Like, okay, I'm going to go look offshore or do you try to do a little bit of everything in your practice time? Uh, I try to do a little bit of everything uh, during practice time. Uh, I mean, obviously, you know about that time frame is pre-spawn, could be pre-spawn slash spawn. So you're going to have some, depending on the moon phases and stuff like that, you could have some that are sitting off deep and then you could have some that have moved up from the last spawn, you know? 
Uh, and as you start catching them closer in that shallow, you have to determine, you know, what size fish are there? Are these buck bass? Are these actually spawning females? Things like that. Uh, you know, deep summer, you know that, I mean, any part of the year, you're always going to have shallow fish and you're always going to have deep fish. Uh, different parts of the year, you're also going to have certain quality is going to be better. You know, during that spawn, obviously the quality of fish is going to be a little bit better shallow. Um, but you do still have some that do spawn a little bit deeper, depending on the lakes and things like that. Summertime, most of your fish moved offshore. They're looking for that cooler water. They're going to go to those brush piles, those offshore grass patches, things like that. So having those electronics, I mean, they're not just because you have an electronics on your boat doesn't mean anything if you don't know how to use them. Yeah, right. So 100%. definitely take the time to utilize them. Um, Mega Live is definitely something that's new to me itself. So that's one thing that I'm still learning uh, as of right now. It basically it verifies that there's fish there. Right. So I'm still learning. OK, is this fish? Is this bluegill? Is this bass? Is this uh, pickerel? Or so and so. But to me, I can look at a dock or a brush pile and say, okay, there's fish on here. Let me fish it for a little bit and see what I can kind of pull up, right? Where before I could just utilize that side scan on the Hummingbird Mega Imaging and the down imaging and the 2D, I scan over something and I can say, okay, this is a brush pile, rock pile, whichever it is. And then I can mark it. And then I also have the GPS puck on my kayak. So that way, oh, as I line it up, Yep. As I line it up, it has that little mark. Okay. Here's my mark. I line it up, make my cast out, and then I can pull it through, you know? Damn, dude, that is badass. Like, how many months do you have with forward facing sonar then? Uh, forward facing sonar, when did I get it? Um, I want to say right before wintertime, actually. Oh, so okay. I haven't yeah. actually had that much time with it to begin with. Um, and most of the time I've had it, it's always been during tournaments and I'm not going to sit there and take the time to learn it during a tournament, you know, practice a little bit. Yeah, I got it. Um, but during the tournaments themselves, I don't want to be sitting there messing around with mega live and stuff like that. Even though it's an amazing tool, I don't, if I don't know it that well, I'm not going to spend that much time trying to, oh, here's fish. And then I waste 45 minutes trying to catch these fish that end up being carp or something like that. You know? That's the paralysis everyone keeps talking about when you get it is it'll, it shows you so much. It's learning how to filter through that information quickly. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, I, like I said, I don't have the experience there to determine whether these are bass or these are carp or, or whichever yet. Uh, and once I do, I think that'll be a key factor for me as far as how much time do I spend on an area. Uh, just because I see fish chasing it doesn't mean that it's a bass, you know? Um, so, and I think people do get, they kind of get locked in on that. They see these fish, oh, there's fish here, there's fish here. And then next thing you know, it's three hours later, they're in the same spot and they could have already picked up three or four other fish uh, for a tournament, but they just spent half their time or quarter of their time on this one spot that didn't produce anything for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, dang, that that is, that is really true. So, we are now in 2023. I'm like, what are, what are some of the tournaments coming up? Um, again, like any of you want to reiterate, what, what clubs are you fishing for? What are some aspirations that you have this year? Yeah. So for me, I mean, I had a couple of goals set up and I've accomplished a lot of them just in the single Lake Murray tournament. You know, I wanted to bring home some Makes hardware. I wanted to bring home, <laughs> I wanted to bring home, you know, one of the big fat checks and hang on my wall, like all the other cool kids did. And, uh, so I accomplished that in the matter of one tournament, you know, personal goals. I want to make sure I catch a limit in every single tournament. You know, that's a big deal. You don't realize how big of a deal it is until you've fished a lot of tournaments. Like, man, if I would have just had that last fish or two more fish, then I would have been in 10th place, you know? And a lot of people, they're so worried about catching these huge fish and they maybe didn't downsize and could have picked up two more fish. So that's one of my, my personal goals for that. Um, obviously, I'd like to make the, the old town pro team itself. So I have to do really well in tournaments. Uh, so for me, I'm going to stick with uh, the KBF tournaments themselves because they give me the most opportunity uh, for me because they have the, the day one and the day two tournaments and stuff like that. So if I go down somewhere, I get two opportunities to fish two amazing tournaments, you know, um, even day two, I ended up 13th and all I needed was to upgrade a 15 inch fish to an 18 inch fish. Oh. And I would have been in top 10, you know? So I have that. I'm sitting in 13th right now for KBF Angler of the Year. So I'd obviously like to move into the top 10. So that way I can hopefully make the uh, the 10 house. So that's definitely a goal. So for me, KBF, the Potomac events next. Uh, if I had the opportunity with my schedule, I'd like to go up to Lake George or um, Chickamauga, I believe is one of the other lakes. So fishing a lot of these other lakes that I've never fished before. Um, 
If those don't work out, I might swing over to a couple of the bass events. Um, if I can get myself a pedal drive, I might hit one of the Hobie events, I think on the uh, Sesqu Sesquahana. Yeah, I think it's Sesquahana. Yeah. So, um, you know, I might have to borrow an you know, Old Town PDL from one of the but one of the club members or something like that to go fish that one. So, it, it, and other than that, man, I'm going to stick with uh MVKBA, man. It's been my home club. They've shown me a lot of support, the amount of love and support that came out of it during Lake Murray tournament, the, the constant, mm -hmm. uh, of my phone dinging and messenger and stuff like that. Just, man, one more fish or, Hey, just get you an upgrade. You're doing good. You know, just the amount of support and love from that club from since day one. Uh, so I want to make sure that I knock out, all their tournaments and spread out a little bit, maybe hit up some BKT tournaments or some bass cast tournaments, all local clubs and stuff like that. And you get everyone to kind of join yeah, up. The, and, and yeah, again, guys, shout out to uh, Northern Virginia kayak association. Um, great, great group of guys linked to in the episode description to all their stuff as well. I know so many people that like to fit and this is just more of a, I don't know, a philosophical question really about how many tournaments is too many tournaments. Cause you mentioned too about like, well, I just got, you know, forward facing sonar hummingbird and I don't have time to use it cause I'm always in tournaments. And I know some guys that have the same thing they're doing the boat side, but it's like, they just got make a live. They got some other stuff on their boats and it's like they're fishing in tournament every other weekend. Can you fish too many tournaments and you need to dial back and be like, Oh, I should just go out and figure this out. Or, I should go fish the river more and practice. Like, like, how do you find that balance? Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, I mean, I think you can fish too many tournaments. I think over time you'll start to get burned out a little bit, just fishing tournaments. You want to have fun. Fishing is supposed to be fun. Uh, and if you're fishing tournaments and you're not having fun, then it's probably time to, to scale back on those. Uh, for me, I look at it maybe a little different than some other anglers. I enjoy the competition aspect mm -hmm. of it. I enjoy going to all these lakes that I've never been before, getting experience outside of Virginia. I think getting experience outside of your state or your local waters, I think it makes you a better angler overall. Um, you know, like I said, last year, KFL, we got the opportunity to go to a lot of different places and fish waters that I never would have fished, um, like St. Clair. I never fished St. Clair before, but I did pretty decent there. I learned how to catch some monster smallmouth. I learned how to use a Ned rig. I learned a little bit more about Nico rigs and drop shots. So, I mean, the tournament aspect, most people aren't going to use anything new when they go into the tournament too. So you got to have those fun fishing days where you go out, uh, get to know your gear a little bit better, uh, break out those techniques that you've never fished before. And, and obviously it has to be at the right time of the year too. And, and build the confidence in them also. You know, I know that I can go to St. Clair and I'm confident throwing a Neko rig or a Ned rig out there. You know, I may not feel confident going somewhere else, but I know if I go to a huge smallmouth lake or deep, clear water lakes, um, then I know it's definitely a technique that I can utilize. So, yeah, I mean, definitely don't burn yourself out on tournaments. You know, for me, like I said, I work shift work a lot. So capitalizing on national level tournaments and then local clubs is what I have to do the best. So I might have uh, a KBF event this weekend, but then I might have work the next three weekends. So I don't yeah. get to get out and fun fish. And that's, that's more so on me, you know, that's my schedule. That's not necessarily like, I'm just only fishing tournaments on the weekends, you know? So, you know, you gotta have a good balance. Spend time with your family too. You know, I learned I that a lot too. If you're constantly <laughs> gone. Yeah. I mean, you know, get your family involved. Really? See, I mean, you enjoy it a lot more whenever your significant other and your kids and stuff like that are cheering you on and they enjoy going fishing with you, but they also understand why you go and do competitions and fishing and stuff like that. So definitely have your family go with you. So you also hit on a very interesting point, which is, um, you know, talking about strengths and weaknesses. I mean, what would you consider something that you wish to improve on this year? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, for me, uh, I definitely want to get better at those titles and the rivers and stuff like that. Those types of fishing, I want to utilize my Mega Live a lot more. You know, I've spent the money on it. So, like I said, if I don't really know how to use it, then it's kind of pointless that you spend all this money and time and effort in getting it if you're not going to take the time to learn how to utilize it. So, I definitely want to be able to utilize that a little bit more, learn how to identify fish uh, on there to help make my time more productive, whether it's practice or fun fishing or something like that, you know, um, man, I, the Potomac, man, it's been killer. Like I I've done okay on the Potomac, but I really want to 
to get a strong finish in there and just figure out the whole title portion of it. You know, what about it frustrates uh, you? And it's just, I don't, I don't, I think my timing is always off. Like I feel fish are right here and then the time moves out and then the fish will move or do something different. It's, I just don't, don't have enough time on it that I think. So it's, you know, if I live 15 minutes from it, and it frustrates me that you live 15 minutes from it. Oh man, dude. Yeah. 15 <laughs> minutes from it, you know, and I go to other lakes because I can catch bigger bass or more bass and stuff like that. So I got to force myself to go outside these lakes that I really know and start pushing my comfort zone. That's a, that's a good problem to have though. It really is. Um, because it, I know so many river rats from growing up that suck on lakes and it's so funny to hear it's refreshing on the flip side. And it's so weird how you, how you grow up fishing is kind of like, it just becomes your strength. But what's nice is this is such an easy part of your game to fix. And once you do it, like you pretty much have everything mastered. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you gotta, you know, once it clicks and stuff like that, you, you kind of figure out something. Once I learned the tidal portion, I mean, then there's also other rivers. Like I haven't done a lot of floats and stuff. It's kind of, I'm not saying it's impossible, but it is a little bit more difficult to do a float with an autopilot 136. It is a bigger <laughs> boat. I'm not saying you can't do it depending on the waters and stuff like that, but, you know, getting around some rocks and things like that, especially because I keep my transducer mounted on the bottom. I don't, really don't want to crack it. Cause it's like a $700 replacement if, uh, break one of the hummingbird transducers. So, but, but that's nice on the, um, on the big, on the big water though. That's really nice to have that, that, that style of kayak. Oh, absolutely. The stability on it and, uh, being able to spot lock over brush pile or onto a main lake point, especially during, um, uh, uh, summertime and stuff like that to sit there and crank spot lock, stand up, throw a plug way out there. Uh, get that dredger down there and start catching fish off of it or throwing a big heavy jig, something like that, but still having the power behind it to uh, to have a good hook penetration. It's definitely nice with that spot lock. And it's designed around the, the motor itself. So a lot of people you'll see with these kayaks, they'll go through and, you know, it's nothing on them or any other brand or anything like that. Obviously, it works for different people. It works for different things. But when you start putting that forward um, motor on there, whether it's a Minn Kota, motor guide, whatever it is, when you start putting it on the front, it starts dipping the nose of the kayak down mm -hmm. into the water more, right? So as you start hitting those bigger waves, it's 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 not designed for it. You know what I mean? So you, you tend to get a lot of water into the kayak or um, the setup, the balance of it, like the old town autopilots are. It's just, they're just designed around it, and the balance for it is amazing. Were I think you posted this about the Lake Gunnersville that incident that happened with the guy. I don't I don't remember if you posted on Facebook about that or not about that guy that had to get rescued. Uh, I did put it in the MVKBA uh, private group chat. Uh, just it's just kind of a reminder for some of the uh, the newer anglers out there. You know, were you it's, there? It's, no, oh, okay. I, I wasn't there. Okay. I'm just I'm just spreading. Gotcha. You know, I'm spreading the information. That angler, I can't remember his name off the top of my head. Um, but, you know, a lot of people don't share those types of moments. You know, uh, if I can remember, he was an experienced kayaker. Uh, the weather caught up to him and stuff like that. You know, some things you, you can't control, you know, like the weather. But it shows that even experienced kayakers, you know, sometimes end up in trouble and things like that happen. So it's just a kind of refresher that just because you're in a kayak, it doesn't make it any less dangerous than a boat or anything like that. You know, you have different things to worry about. Yeah. And you can't just throw down the 250 and then haul ass to the, uh, to the boat ramp. You know what I mean? And, and that, when the rain starts yeah, coming up. And that's something that I really think has to be hit hard. Cause I know there's more and more people that try to get in contact with me because of now my outlet being like, well, how do I get into kayak fishing? What do I need? And I think it's very important to have you guys like you on to understand, like when it's cold, what do you need to bring with you? Because all it takes is one time you going over and it can be get real bad. How do you dress in these colder times? Yeah. I mean, I always keep that rule of 120, right? So, uh, you know, take the water temperature and then the air temperature. If it's under 120, make sure you have some type of uh, layers that are a little bit more waterproofing to where if you fall into the water, uh, I think there's a hydronaut suit or something like that. Um, if you fall into the water, you know, you know, cause you don't want to get hypothermia or anything like that. Uh, as it starts to warm up, you can start to layer a little bit more as the water temps start to going up and the air temperatures start going up. You start removing a little bit more of those layers, you know, summertime, uh, you can be in shorts or pants, you know, obviously keep the sun in mind. You don't want to end up with some type of skin cancer or something like that. So 
Um, but yeah, that rule of 120, man, one, if, once those air temps are kind of below that 120 mark, make sure you have some type of hydronaut suit where it'll keep you dry, even if you flip your kayak, at least for enough time for you, someone to come self-rescue or someone to come in, rescue you, or you can get to the shore itself. You know, don't worry about your gear and stuff like that, because if that hypothermia kicks in, you're not going to be able to swim and you're going to just drown. And don't ever go back and try to save somebody, especially once you've already been in, because it's just now it's two people that they have to rescue. Oh, my God. Yeah. That just reminded me of that Smith Mountain Lake incident with those two boys. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's just, and guys, if you don't know this, like uh, two kids were in a boat and it went over. One of them swam to shore. He went back out to try to save his friend. And then sadly, it sounded like it cost both of them. And yeah, I mean, absolutely. It, it's it sucks. And I don't like to try to break down the episode with this. But again, we're fishing more and more in colder and colder climates now. So I just want to make sure everyone's safe out there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and wintertime's an amazing time yeah. to get out there. Uh, the lake's empty. You're not going to have as much boat traffic. The waves are down a little bit, but you do have to worry about the wind and the water temps and stuff like that. You've got to be a little bit more patient. You're going to catch quality of fish. You're not going to catch as many fish all the time, depending on the lakes. I mean, if it's a power plant lake, you might catch more than a normal lake because the water temps tend to stay up a little bit more. But uh, it's, it's an amazing time to get out there. You just have to make sure you put all the safety precautions in place. Uh, have a good plan. Also, you know, tell your significant other, tell a friend, hey, I'm going to, you know, yes. to this place. Uh, I should be back around this time. Uh, if you don't mind checking in on me or if you haven't heard from me by this time, give me a call or something like that. Right. So that way, at least somebody knows if something happens to you. They know exactly where to start looking first. That's a really, and this is another point I heard about the importance of like traveling together through these big tournaments is, um, and it's not about the information, but as much about like you have somebody because it's one thing if it's your local lake, but if you do drive down to to some place like St. Clair, well, if you have a group of guys you went with, you have your structure there, and and I think that's important for people to know. If you go out of town, it's kind of nice to travel with someone so you have a safety net there because your wife can't help you if she's you know two states over. Yeah, absolutely. You know, for, for us, we, we kind of have the same group of guys that I always go with, it's, you know, three to four of us. Um, and every now and again, we'll get an extra guy or something like that. So you make more friends. Uh, but for those three or four guys, we kind of share our um, Google Maps to each other. Smart. You know, we trust each other with our spots and things like that. Like, I know if they see me fishing a spot, they're not going to go over there and fish that spot or stuff like that. Uh, but we do share that Google Maps portion of it. So that way I know Okay, well, I haven't heard from some, you know, so and so. The last place that I could see on the maps that he was at was over in this cove. That you know, is a it really, was yeah, that's a 15, good tip. 20 minutes ago. So, you know, and obviously you want to trust people that you trust and stuff like that. So, no, but that that's guys, that's a really good tip. Make sure you make sure you take that into consideration because I am used to like again as I getting more and more into the kayak world, going in a boat, just hopping in. I really don't tell anyone where I'm going. I feel like I'm going to be okay. Now as I travel more with a kayak, I do like the idea. I'm trying to start traveling with people just so I know when shit hits the fan because that that post did kind of freak me out a little bit. It's like you do not want to get in those situations. Um, and again, just just be safe out on the water. Um, well, yeah, thank you so much uh, for coming on tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, um, I want to make sure, is there any sponsors or anyone you would like to plug or anything that we forgot to mention? No, I mean, I think that just about covers it, man. Uh, yeah, like like I mentioned before, family, man, my my future wife, Becca, man, she's been supportive since we've been together. She understands how important tournaments are and fishing is to me personally. And I know to a lot of other veterans, it's a, it's a great outlet for veterans to go to, especially whenever they get out. Uh, so she's so been very super supportive of that, um, allowing me to go to these tournaments with a newborn baby. You know, wow. she's handle, handling her for a week and stuff like she's that. A saint. So, yeah. So, you know, I got to thank her for that. Obviously, God, for giving me the opportunity, being healthy and stuff like that to go down to Lake Murray and to be able to compete and place like I did. Um, Old Town Kayaks and Canoes, you know, they're, they've been a sponsor for two years now. And it's such an amazing team. And I think they set up what the epitome of a pro staff should be, a pro staff, a pro team, or just being a part of a huge kayak company like that. Uh, I couldn't thank them enough for the amount of support. Uh, you know, Old Town, Lake Murray, I mean, we were top four day one. Wow. You know, we took, uh, out of five trophies, we took, oh, or sorry, out of six trophies, we took home five of them. That's Between awesome. day one and day two. Um, so, 
obviously it's a phenomenal team. We're only getting better. Uh, I have to thank them a lot. Um, Outdoor Dreaming has been a sponsor since day one, even before I could probably even catch a fish. Uh, as one of my buddies in the Marines, um, he was our corpsman. He has a business up there in Maryland. Check them out if you want to go gator hunting and stuff like that. He also has a camp called Outdoor Dreaming Camp down in Louisiana. If you want to do a little gator hunting, like swamp people, stuff like that. Uh, actually, ironically, where my hometown is, where I grew up. So that's so cool. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, you know, Abu Garcia and Berkeley, they're not official sponsors or anything like that, but those are products that I've been using for the last two years and I stand behind them. I mean, you can see, I like the Revos between the, the Abu Garcia tournament edition fishing rods, which I told you earlier that I it took me a while to find setups that really work for me as a kayak angler. Uh, those rods are perfect in the medium heavy and stuff like that, whether they're spinning or bait casters. And then I only carry two types of reels, and that's the Revos and our the Revo brand itself, the Revo Rockets and the Revo SXs, hmm. right? So I either have a super high speed 10 to one or I have a lower speed uh six point uh six to six ratio. Living right? on the edges. So, <laughs> yeah, so there's no in between because I, I had to dumb down everything. I had to make things simple for me, right? And there's no I have a six eight raw or I have a six eight gear ratio or I have a five two for this and then like you just, you just get confused. So all my single point uh type applications, jigs, um uh, Anything that doesn't move, you jig, shaky heads, things like that. I always go with that 10, 10 to 1, so that way I can set the hook, get them to the boat fast, get them in the net, and get my pictures taken, get them out. Uh, anything that's moving, I use that 6 to 6 gear ratio, chatter baits, crankbaits, uh, things like that. If it's a, if I really need to slow it down, I really slow it down and feel every little tick. So that way it, it doesn't confuse me with anything, right? Mm-hmm. So, uh, like I said, not official sponsors, but I did utilize their products a lot to get me here. Uh, over the last two years. Uh, NVKBA, like I said, they're an amazing club. If you want to get into kayak fishing and you're in the Nova area, uh, please reach out to us. We'd love to have you. If you don't have any experience in kayak fishing, uh, there's a kayak fishing expo held at Jake's Bait and Tackle on March 25th. So March 25th, and they're also going to have a kind of like a kayak car show type thing, right? Get your, get your kayak set up and they'll do, you can win some gift cards there too. And there's plenty of people there that you can ask a, a lot of questions and more than willing to give out that information as far as making your kayak better or safety wise or their tips and tricks. You know, like I said, they're an amazing club. We love to share information. It's almost like a second family. Um, so make sure you reach out to them. Uh, Hummingbird, Minn Kota, all those, you know, they're part of the Johnson Outdoor family. If it wasn't for that, the the Solix and the Mega Live from Hummingbird, then, you know, I wouldn't have been able to find those fish or those areas. The mapping for that new One Boat Network app, it's phenomenal. You know, make sure you download that, whether you own a Hummingbird or not. Have all the latest types of mapping, right? Um, and the Minkota, I mean, it's an amazing motor. I've used it since I had a boat because I used to have a boat. I sold it and bought a kayak. That's how much I enjoy kayak fishing. And it had the old tracks and Solix is on there also. So Minn Kota's always been a phenomenal motor for me. I've never had any issues with it. Uh, I mean, other than that, I, that's pretty much it, man. I appreciate all of them and all the support they've given me. Um, I also support Mission 22. So, you know, 22 veterans a day, um, you know, it's 22 too many. So make sure any opportunities and tournaments and things like that, you have to support those or two of hollow projects, things like that. Make sure you reach out to those and join those. And, you know, it's okay to not be okay. Reach out to a friend if you're having troubles. Reach out to me. I'm always open. No, no, hailed all that. And guys, as always, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about today. Uh, you know, really make sure you try to get out there, support 22. I, hopefully I can get that information from you. Or I'll try to find a link for that so I can put that in the episode description as well because I know I have a lot of veterans that listen to this show. Um, and I probably, I guess I'll see you at, at the uh, Jake's Kayak Show and, and Fishing Seminar. Um, but yeah, well, thank you so much for coming on. I really do appreciate taking the time out of your your off day with, with the kid and the family to just kind of stay here and, and tell everyone about how you did. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I appreciate you having me on once again. You know, uh, this time I did a little bit better than the last I, time. I dude, I know. So, you know, it's amazing. I'm glad that I actually got you, you know, on here with the trophy. Yeah, hopefully I get, uh, you know, I get to grow a little bit, you know, and continue to do that. 
So I'll do my best to be out uh, the Jake's bait and tackle. I do have work that day. I'm trying to work out some plans to swap some shifts around with some people. So uh, I really want to go out there and especially put up the old town kayak and set it up for that kayak car show, you know, dude, so, yeah, that'd be awesome. It's, it's going to be interesting. We'll see how it goes. But, uh, but again, guys, you know, we might be done talking here. Uh, but again, just like and subscribe to the channel and we'll see you next time on fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Aaron's and Jared mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's bait and tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.